It's Entertainment Law Update, episode 172. It's October 2nd, 2024. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Entertainment Law Update from Los Angeles, California. I am Gordon Firemark. And from the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, I'm Tamara Bennett. And this is our podcast where we talk about entertainment law. Every month we pull together a roundup of legal news and commentary and business news in the entertainment industry and share our opinions and our comments and analysis and try to have a good time with it and keep it interesting for you as well. So welcome back to this episode. Thank you for being here, Tamara. What's new with you? Oh, just trying to settle back in. Last we spoke, we were headed to Iceland, and that was fantastic. I highly recommend a trip. We, uh, yeah, it's it is an out of the world kind of place to go. And yeah. if you're on the East Coast, it's like super quick to get there from the East Coast. So, yeah. um, anyway, lots yeah. of fun and just uh, you know been busy with work and home and life. How about you? Busy with work, home, and life. I haven't had any uh, outstanding excursions. <laughs> other than the grocery store. <laughs> so, um, but it's all good. You know, we're back in school season. So the kids are there doing their thing and, and, uh, we're, uh, dad's taxi service is up and running and operational. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, anyway, we've got a couple of upcoming events we want to tell folks about. Um, well, one in particular, the, uh, CLE program at the University of Texas, uh, with in conjunction with the, you, you know, the relationship, the, uh, yeah, entertainment the, section the, of the bar there. Yeah. Yeah. The entertainment law Institute, uh, that's going to be hosted by UT law CLE, uh, in Austin. And let's see, our dates are the 20th is boot camp, 21st mm -hmm. and 22nd is the two day, uh, CLE. So it's three yeah. days. You can sign up for a uh, boot camp and or sign up for the two day event. And Gordon is going to be presenting. I am looking forward for, to you're you're doing unions, right? We're, so I'm on a, I'm I'm part of a panel. We just had a an organizational meeting of our panel the other day, and it's gonna be a good panel about the sort of the the follow up on the outcome fallout of the 2023 strikes by the Writers Guild and Screen Actors Guild. So I'll be talking about the Writers Guild side and we have a representative from the SAG after a side of things and uh, should be a, a good conversation just to sort of bring everybody up to speed on on uh, where we are now as opposed to where we were before the strikes. So yeah. sure. and it's just lots of good. I mean, I really think there's going to be some great presentations and panels. So everybody mm -hmm. go check that out. I, I, I'm not presenting this year and I hope to be there in person, uh, but I've not confirmed that yet. So oh. hopefully I will see everyone there in person uh, for at least part of the time. So anyway, awesome. I will miss you if I don't get to see you in person. Well, <laughs> nothing is permanent. So we'll, I know, uh, I know. Yeah. Well, let's dive into our show content because we have a pretty full rundown of stories to cover. And the first one is a, I'd say it's a pretty big impact case coming from the Second Circuit dealing with the Internet Archives free digital library book sharing program. The case is Hachette Book Group Inc. versus Internet Archive and uh, came down in early September from the Second Circuit, in which the Hachette Book Group lost their appeal in the copyright case. I'm sorry, the Internet Archive lost its appeal uh, in the case with uh, Hachette and three other publishers. The Court of Appeals has affirmed that lower court decision from March of last year, 23, uh, that the Archive's open library program is called copyright infringement, and that the 500,000 full works that are uh, included in that digital uh, archive have to be removed and, and uh, inaccessible to the public through that library. So what it is, is the, the Internet Archive is this law standing operation that, you know, is designed and, and intended to preserve and provide access to all the digitized content. It went back to 1996, they wanted to save all the ephemeral content of the internet. And you and I have both from time to time gone and looked at the Wayback Machine to see what mm -hmm. a website looked like 12, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, whatever. And that's great. And um, 
So it has as its mission, it says, to provide universal access to all knowledge. Doesn't that sound like something out of Star Trek? <laughs> the organization expanded to digital versions of published works with special attention paid to books. And uh, the argument is, hey, not everybody has access to a library where they can access a good collection of stuff. So they, they wanted to provide this universal access by providing digital versions of many, many, many books. They um, uh, they view their mission as serving people who are sort of underserved and and who have difficulty interacting with physical books. So a lot of it is available for people with screen reader software, print disabilities, those kinds of things. So um, and I'll just interject. I, I mean, not only have I used the, the Wayback Machine mm -hmm. because we I, I actually use that a lot, especially yeah. in my trademark practice. Um, but on the Internet Archive was a book indexed that was originally published in 1905. Yeah. So it is in the public domain. <clears throat> yeah, sure. And and so there have been instances where I have used it and found content that was helpful for what I needed mm -hmm. that was public domain. But we're not talking about things that are in the public domain no. as far as this lawsuit. We're yeah. talking about works that are still protected by copyright. Yeah, and these publishers that do offer ebook licenses to libraries based on, you know, the size of their memberships and the collections and things depends on the publisher, of course, but they the publishers recognize, look, ebooks are taking the place of print books. Um, they don't accumulate wear and tear. So these are tend to be higher cost than if they were buying a physical print copy of the book. Anyway, the, the question presented in the case was, is this, this nonprofit organization, the, the Internet Archives, um, scanning of these copyright protected print books in their entirety and distributing those digital copies online, is that a fair use? Um, if they're, they're doing it for free, subject to a one-to-one, -one own-to-loan ratio, so they're you know, they only loan one copy that at a time. And, to, yeah. and I didn't realize that, that yeah, they that's... have a system in place to, mm -hmm. to monitor, you know, if I, if I quote, check the book out, right. Gordon can't check it out till I return it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I read a lot of library books on my Kindle that I get from I my too. public library. So, um, the, the systems are in place for managing that part of it. So the courts decided that, um, Applying the relevant provisions of the copyright law and Supreme Court and Second Circuit precedent, uh, they said, no, it's not fair use that um, the IAs claim that prohibiting its practices would hurt customers and researchers and allowing its practices would harm authors. And, um, you know, with each digital book that the archive disseminates, it deprives publishers and authors of the revenue due to, due to them as compensation for their unique creations. Okay, um, so the the appellants in the case, um, you know, they're worried about consolidation of editorial power and criticizing publishers for profit motivated. Hey, you know what? <laughs> if every business in it for the money, <laughs> right, right, uh, yeah, because book publishing is such a lucrative business these days. Um, I may be talking out of my hat on that one, but anyway. <laughs> Um, so they're, they're talking about, you know, promoting public availability, very, these very altruistic points of view, and that's fine. But, um, anyway, the court relied on the, the ruling in the Authors Guild versus Google case from 2015, also Second Circuit petition for cert on that case was denied, of course, but, uh, the Google Books case, the court said, um, Google's unauthorized digitizing of the copyright protected material creation of a search functionality and displaying snippets from those works were non-infringing fair use. So then distinguishing that, that that was highly transformative because it turns it into a research tool basically. But, um, here they, they're saying Google's, uh, sorry, I'm jumping around here. They also said that Google's provision of the digitized copies to the libraries that supplied the books on the understanding that they would only be used in a way consistent with copyright law, also not copyright infringement. But here, um, the, the court is saying, well, yeah, but you're making entire copies of books available. The distinction was in Google, it was a snapshot snippet. They may have scanned the whole book, but right. they only make a snapshot snippet available. So um, not a substitute experience or consuming opportunity. Right. 
And I also get very frustrated when I get in Google Books and find the snippet mm -hmm. and then can't get the book. But <laughs> Skype right lawyer, I have to calm down right. and, and do this appropriately. Uh, I did go back and I know I've been talking about it, or at least I've been talking about it in my own head. <laughs> To find the law, well, it, it was fairly well law review-ish, but I did it for a CLE, an article about the Google Books case yeah. in 2006. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And I think I was wrong in my analysis because the court ruled in favor on most things for Google Books. But my analysis fit nicely within mm -hmm. the uh, this current case as far as using and reproducing the whole book. I also want to make our... Uh, listeners and viewers aware of the pending litigation, UMG recordings mm -hmm. at all versus Internet Archive. Yeah. Uh, multiple record labels have joined forces and sued the Internet Archive, uh, well, basically making the same arguments. And mm -hmm. so that case is continuing to proceed where, um, yeah, I kind of realized that I was looking at some recordings from the 20s and 30s and 40s, 50s sound recordings. And suddenly realized they were all available on the Internet Archive. And I'm like, well, this is odd. Yeah. You know, the ones from before, you know, 1920, whatever, depending on the time I was looking at mm -hmm. it, when things went public domain. I was like, oh, this is a great resource. But again, not the sound recordings and songs that are still under copyright. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that one as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that that's actually tandem cases going in New York and California from the Yeah, I think so. They've got two two different cases going on. So. Well. We'll be uh keeping you posted as those things come down. Although this case may actually have an impact on the party's posture toward settlement and I think it I apologize. I don't remember if it was the case in New York or California. One of them has moved into alter to dispute resolution. Okay. So maybe some things will get worked out, but there's still active filings in PACER. So. Okay. Well, we'll keep an eye on that. Our next story comes uh, from our friend of the show, Mickey Glazer from Talent Law Corporation, who sent over a note the other day to call our attention to this uh, uh, trademark decision by the TTAB canceling the mark for superhero after seven, 70, no, 57 excuse me, yeah. uh, years of uh, registration. So on September 26th, the USPTO and the TTAB issued a trademark ruling canceling four trademarks relating to variations of the term superhero that were jointly held by DC Comics and Marvel Comics ever since 1967. Pretty intense. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and that's pretty unique that mm -hmm. the parties would come together and and not a, consent <laughs> to yeah. have uh, superheroes as one word and as two words mm -hmm. um, between, you know, competitors to do that. But they could, uh, you know, I, well, I think. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the strong arguments in the case here in this in this petition was that you know look a trademark is supposed to identify the source of goods or services not the sources of goods or services you imagine if if uh <clears throat> well you know coke and pepsi both own the the brand for something like cola, cola. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um whole you know there's other descriptiveness things there but anyway in the case of the superhero marks dc and marvel had gotten themselves together um to i guess Establish this duopoly where just let's keep everybody else out of this. <laughs> What's the old saying? You know, one lawyer in a small town will starve, but two can make a nice living. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's okay. So same, same kind of idea here with the superhero term. In any event, <clears throat> it was approved by the USPTO and, and registered, you know, back then in the late sixties and has been just sort of humming along as we've gone. I, I, and honestly, I don't know how strongly they've enforced it over the years either. We certainly see the word superhero show up from time to it, time. It it does. I would have never thought about that being a protected trademark. There were four mm -hmm. registrations yep. at issue, uh, one related to comic books and magazines, toy figures, T-shirts, masquerade costumes, um, 
But the UK comic artist, uh, Reichold, he filed the petition because he has various uses of the mark super babies uh, related to telling stories for children. Yeah. Um, and he argued in his petition for cancellation on these four registrations that superhero is a common non-proprietary term synonymous with a genre of fictional characters. He, again, you talked about this lack of a single source, so also that it's generic. Um, sorry, we're having an emergency alert. I'm sure it's just some kind of weird weather thing going off on my phone. Uh, I apologize. And that he was thought that, you know, this is, is this to prevent competitors from using the term for any similar work. And he argued this is anti-competitive. Mm -hmm. And so the process goes, there's a process of the TTAB. It's yeah. an administrative process. Uh, it's hard to cancel trademarks mm -hmm. that have been in continuous use uh, for, you know, more than five years, which obviously these have and all yeah. of the necessary renewal documentations and affidavits of, of continuous use have been filed. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't file a cancellation and claim that he also claimed in addition to genericness that the marks had been abandoned. Mm. Um, so Marvel and DC did initially, I think, make of record can uh, legal counsel, mm -hmm. but do you know what they didn't do? <laughs> They didn't file an answer. Yeah. yeah. So what happens in a in a TTAB proceeding or a court case when the defendants don't file an answer? You get a default. <laughs> yeah. You get a default judgment. And so that's what the petitioner did in this case because mm -hmm. the respondents didn't file. And the TTAB said in a very short and sweet, no answer was filed. We're going to cancel the marks. So can we speculate as to why these two powerhouses would not have filed an answer to a cancellation proceeding? Well, before we go there, I want to speculate as to why this petition ever, why he felt it needed to be brought. I mean, it, it from oh, the sounds of things. He, his, his, I think it, they opposed his applications. Uh, oh, he was applying for registration for his he brand. He was applying okay. for registrations and they were blocking. So that's why he. Okay. Did. So it's not like he got a cease and desist demand or something like that. It was, yeah, we own it. I don't know that he got a cease and desist, but I know he was having hiccups at the trademark okay. office getting his registrations, okay. getting his applications. So, so if they're going to go to the trouble of opposing some other registration, why then default on the case? the cancellation petition you're right it's a it's a head scratcher and i am wondering sorry mm -hmm. loyal viewers and listeners i don't have the answer to this question i don't know if they opposed his application and or if the examiner cited the registrations oh, against yeah. the mark it could be a combination of both. Sure. either way it led to him making the effort and spending the money yeah. to file for a cancellation uh and so and these two that? giant comics companies decide not to invest in defending this registration. And I don't think it, this is me. Obviously they have the ability to appeal this decision. There's a process for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they just said, we're not going to enforce these rights any longer. Yeah. So, and I this is the least expensive way to do that. Yeah. Well, I guess that means that, those of us who want to use the word super in combination with another word to, you know, reference what we do. And, and there are other brands out there like Super Lawyer, for example. But, uh, yeah, it's a little less problematic for those I that think so. would what worry we don't about know it. Is, yeah. What else is registered on the trademark registry that you need to look at? But I... I don't think it, quote, throws these terms into what we would, you know, we don't really use public domain when it comes yeah. to trademarks, but I think it could, can it be used to assert genericness? I mean, the court didn't rule on that. The court did not rule on, gen is it generic? The court did not rule on if it's abandoned. And that's, oh, now that I'm speaking, that's why they didn't respond. They yeah. didn't want a court ruling saying this term is generic or mm. the, these this term has been abandoned now they don't have that so could they continue to try and enforce common law rights no. maybe 
Yeah, it'd be or interesting to see. We, or see the will format. we see some new trademark filings? Yeah, it could be something along those lines too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Fun stuff. Yeah. You want to quickly cover this story about X? Sure. X, formerly known as Twitter, or mm -hmm. it always makes me think of Prince. Yeah. Uh, First Amendment social media platforms, the Ninth Circuit, out of the Ninth Circuit panel, reversed the district court's order denying that social media platform owner X, formerly Twitter, uh, motion for a preliminary injunction to enjoin enforcement of California state law, Assembly Bill AB 587. So AB 587 requires large social media companies to post their terms of service and to submit reports to the AG of California about those terms of services and their content moderation policies and practices. The Ninth Circuit's recent decision in, in X versus Fanta enjoined significant portions of AB 587, again, a state law. Uh, it's an, saying it's an editorial transparency law, law targeting large user-generated content publishers. So who are large user-generated content publishers? X, TikTok, hmm. Facebook. YouTube, um, AB 587 required those platforms to make these detailed disclosures about how they moderated content and their policies. Uh, and that could include hate speech, extremism, disinformation. The court affirmed that this AB 587 violated the platform's First Amendment rights as it compelled non-commercial speech. Um, hmm. The court rejected the argument that these disclosures were commercial speech, emphasizing that they were editorial in nature and not linked to a specific commercial transaction or advertisement. And the opinion pointed out that requiring companies to disclose opinions on contentious issues invades the platform's right to remain silent on such matters. The case is a significant win for tech platforms in yeah. resisting government-mandated editorial transparency. Um, in what may be deemed politically sensitive areas. However, the issue of compelled commercial speech remains a complex issue. Of course it does, with the Ninth Circuit's decision diverging from other recent rulings. Mm -hmm. The case was reversed and remanded with instructions to enter a pre preliminary injunction and determine if these particular provisions of AB 587 can be severed, I guess in an attempt to retain yeah. other provisions of 587. So kind of cut these provisions out well this raises an interesting question in my mind about does this mean now that a law that requires that websites have a privacy policy is that a mandated non non-commercial speech issue are we going to see you know california's privacy act which is one of the stronger ones in the in the country and and uh, maybe even app applied to you know a GDPR case or something like that. Could could this really upend all of the web requirements that we you know you, I don't know about you, but I'm constantly telling clients if you're launching a web page, you need to have a privacy policy. You need your terms of service listed there somewhere so you can have people click through. Um, is mandating any kind of speech? You know, well, that's right, it, it, and I guess I mean I don't know why I struggle with this. I mean newspapers in the good old I obviously they have first amendment rights so mm -hmm. I, I guess why wouldn't a platform have first amendment rights but yeah I, I still think it's what's what is commercial speech what is editorial yeah you know what is well, user generated content <clears throat> what is editorial content what is commercial speech yeah well I mean this was requiring all of those things are protected by the first amendment yeah yeah, but this is about their terms of service. I guess the content moderation policies and practices is they could sort of a consider it sort of proprietary, but also it that by shining a light on that and requiring that disclosure, does that chill them from exercising their rights as fully as they want in the way they moderate? I, I can see the arguments both sides, but it, it really yeah. does feel like this could be uh, the beginning of a slippery slope. Well, I person. don't think it's going to be the end of it. And I suspect, I, I don't know if there's other pending litigation relating yeah. to 587 or not We're on this point, but yeah. there probably I, is. Well, I, I suspect so. I haven't looked into yeah. how much other stuff, but yeah. 
Um, well, staying in California, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about some AI laws that have been signed into law here in the U.S. and and also, excuse me, in California, and also one that has been vetoed. So um, in a bold regulatory step uh, addressing AI, uh, the governor here of California has now signed a couple of groundbreaking bills uh, that make it illegal to use AI-generated digital replicas to replace actors without their consent. And the first one of those is AB 1836 that protects deceased individuals by requiring the estate's approval for any AI recreation. And then the second bill, AB 2602, prevents uh, contracts from allowing AI replicas to substitute for living performers without a specific consent. That's interesting. So this legislation, um, you know, first in the U.S., really applies to all Californians, not just its union members, which is the scope of what we've seen so far. Um it removes previous exceptions for film and TV work, so that has an impact on the labor industry and so on. In the video game industry, which is currently on strike and looks to be for a while yet, um, and uh, you know, as federal protections like the No Fakes Act are coming into uh, into focus, uh, California law is setting a sort of a new standard for balancing innovation against performers' rights. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I teased this other story that that Newsom had vetoed a controversial bill. This one was uh, AI Safety Bill SB one zero four seven, which was trying to impose some strict safety regulations on the development and deployment of these large AI models. The bill was um, proposed by Senator State Senator Scott Weiner. He required AI, it would have required AI models to undergo safety certification and have control mechanisms to prevent potential dangers like bioweapon creation um, or causing critical kinds of harm. And of course, it was the tech giants like Google and OpenAI that um, opposed it strongly. And Newsom said it was too much of a one-size-fits-all uh, one approach and and uh, failed to take into consideration sort of contextual stuff about how these were going to be deployed, and and uh, he was really concerned it would it would hinder economic competitiveness for the state's uh, uh, AI industry and its currently leading role in that industry. So, yeah. I mean, on first blush, that all sounds good. Yeah, we don't want <laughs> yeah. we we don't want mass creation or mass weapons AI right. generated kind of things, but there has to be that balancing act. And I think that was the overall concern. What about these smaller things that it could prohibit them from their development? So it, two, two kind of interesting ones that I think really apply to us in mm -hmm. our everyday practice are bills related signed by Gavin Newsom yeah. out of the AI field, but, but just signed regarding child influencers. So California assembly bill 1880 expands California's longtime Coogan law mm -hmm. protections for child performers to include influencers and online con cre content creators who are minors. Again, putting certain protections as to how long the contract can be, putting money aside into trust. Mm -hmm. uh, does the Coogan also maybe put in place guardians as well if needed? Well, and Yeah, the act uh, at large does require for studio teachers on sets of films okay. and things like that when kids are going to be missing normal school time. And, and, you know, it really is the Child Labor Protection Act for the entertainment industry. And, you know, it's named after Jackie Coogan, who was the child star um, whose parents squandered all his money in the night. He was a millionaire when he was, you know, 15 years old or something, and the money was gone by the time he was an adult. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then... Go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to say Senate Bill 764 sp specifically states that on online influencers featuring, featuring children in at least 30% of their output mm -hmm. must put away a percentage of gross earnings in trust for the minor for when they become an adult. Uh, the bill also requires creators to maintain, oh my gosh, books and records of income generated from content featuring, featuring children, how many minutes the minors appeared in that yeah. content. So... I think this is wise. I think it's crazy. We had to go in and and specifically add this. Um, 
our Texas law related to this actually is in the estates code. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know that it's been amended to specifically say, quote, influencers. I've always applied it to influencers. Um, well, parents are often very surprised by these mm-hmm. things and their requirements. The, the bigger issue I've had is uh, how the, the parents don't want to take the tax hit for the revenue uh, that's coming in. Well, so, so here in here in California, part of the Coogan law also specifies that the earnings of the child are property of the child in most yeah, places. Yeah, Texas doesn't. Common law says that children's the children are chattel, and so the results and proceeds right. of their efforts belong to the parents as well. And so, so here, parents wouldn't have to pay the tax. Okay. The kid would have its own, have to do its own filing and those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, the, I've seen this, and and actually wondered this a couple of times on you know out loud. Hey, here's this channel where this kid is doing these unboxings and playing with toys and giving his opinions about mm-hmm. these things, and he's making millions of dollars in one instance. And, you know, I, I, I think his parents have done well by him and invested it wisely. So he'll have something to show for all this stuff he's doing as a kid. But there are also those mom fluencers out there who are constantly bringing their kids on screen and, and involving them in their whatever activities they're doing. And, you know, at some point you have to decide, okay, is the kid working? (laughs) And if so, are they being compensated? How are they being compensated? It's not all mom's money. So, um, We'll probably be making contracts between kids and parents as as these kinds of things go on to oh, address some well, of that. And then do we have to get Le- the court Le- approval? Rhymes, anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And you know, I mean, you go back in history. There's lots and lots of cases of of uh, child performers uh, being uh, exploited by people close to them and who yeah. were and suing. Yeah, uh, that oftentimes too. Oftentimes after the fact. So mm-hmm. interesting. Well, yeah. If you're putting your if you're putting your kids online. Even for the best of things, remember, if you're making money, some of that's theirs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, now we come to a story that we have to do a little bit of a trigger warning because this discussion of this case in the underlying case in the story is a wrongful death of a child case. So that may be triggering and not appropriate for some listeners. I'm going to do my best to make sure there's a chapter marker in after this story so that if you want to jump forward, that that's uh, as easy as possible to do. But we do want to talk about it because it involves TikTok. And their um, defense using Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. In this case, uh, the plaintiff, Tawana Anderson, sued TikTok and its parent company, ByteDance, over the wrongful death of her 10-year-old daughter, Nyla. Nyla had died after attempting to replicate a blackout challenge video that was recommended by the TikTok algorithm on her personalized For You page. The challenge was widely criticized for its dangerous content and involves self-asphyxiation until the participant loses consciousness. So the plaintiff in the case alleged that TikTok was aware of the dangers posed by the challenge and continued to allow users to post the content. And she claimed that the algorithm specifically recommended and promoted the video to Nyla, contributing to her death. And her claims against TikTok were negligence, Strict products liability, wrongful death, and survival claims under Pennsylvania law. So the issue, of course, in the case is the application of Section 230 immunity, um, which you know is usually granted to these interactive com- computer services, um, immunity from liability for content that posted by the third parties. And the district court initially dismissed the case, saying that TikTok was fully protected under 230. Um, finding that TikTok was, wasn't responsible for creating the challenge and merely was hosting this third-party content. So Anderson appealed that, arguing that no, the recommendation algorithm was more than a passive conduit for third-party content, and she asserted that it, it, it was active curation and promoting of the content like the Blackout Challenge. And uh, the appeals court took a look and... Um, And they said, no, the algorithm is an expressive activity in itself. And the Supreme Court decisions in uh, what Moody versus NetChoice, where the court held that the social media platforms engage in their own expressive activity when they use algorithms to organize, prioritize, and recommend content. And so they said, no, this is covered by Section 230. It's 
it's TikTok's first party speech that would be regulated here. And, and it's not just the third party content. So, um, since section 230 protects, uh, only protects these internet computer systems from liability for third party content and the algorithm constitute its own expressive activity, the court ruled that section 230 doesn't apply to Anderson's claims. The court then reversed the district court's dismissal in part, vacated it in part, and remanded for further proceedings that allow Anderson's claims to proceed, uh, at least for now, based on TikTok's role in promoting harmful content through the algorithm. Um, there was a dissent from a, a circuit judge, Matey, M-A-T-E-Y, um, dissenting in part and concurring in part. And he said, look, TikTok contends that Anderson's claims are barred by Section 230, which several courts have adopted, but a more precise reading suggests a narrower scope of this immunity that we're talking about. Historically, liability for transmitting third-party information followed traditional legal principles where the transmitter, like a telegraph company, was not held responsible unless they had specific knowledge of that harmful content. Here, the debate around online service provider liability goes back to the 90s. Initially, courts were treating online service providers, CompuServe and Prodigy, Cubby, you know, the Cubby versus CompuServe case, they were treating them as though they were a distributor unless they knew of the harmful content. Um, and that decision uh, considered CompuServe as the distributor, no editorial control and so on. But then in Stratton Oakmont versus Prodigy, services company, uh, the court found the prodigy was liable because it had editorial moderating kind of control over things. And so we had that dichotomy set up that led to the enactment of section 230. Uh, but section 230 has really been in the crosshairs for the last five or six years anyway, maybe longer, um, as being sort of outdated and, and unnecessary now that the internet has grown up to be what it is in any event. Um, here we have the section 230 doesn't apply is the ruling, but I got to ask you, do you think that, um, there are other first amendment defenses available? If, if, if in fact this was TikTok's commercial, uh, exp expressive speech, then isn't holding them liable for, well, I don't know. Is there maybe a, another first amendment defense in these kind of cases? I don't know. I don't know. I, hmm? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, you know, I, I'm just so, well, I, w I was triggered when I, yeah, when of course. Our summary to think, you know, this is awful. Someone should be responsible. Do you remember, TikTok. do you remember in the, I want to say the eighties, there were lawsuits or, or accusations flying around about the content of certain, I think it was Black Sabbath or Ozzy Osbourne Recordings records. Recordings were causing people to commit suicide. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't remember how any of those came up, but again, isn't that just f first amendment? I mean, I, but, um, see, I think the difference is hmm. the, while I don't think anyone should post a video of what they posted the videos of yeah. in this case, as much as I disagree with the content, whoever mm -hmm. posted that video, that was their freedom of expression. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. TikTok. I think as an obligation, there are, are they putting other violent acts against people on their platform? Well, you, maybe you get into cases like what was it, Brandenburg, with the incitement standard, and you know, is there a clear and present danger that these that there's actual imminent harm um, to be caused? You yeah. know, at any point, does TikTok have to decide? No, we can't let that stuff through. Um, anyway, well, I think these are the issues we're going to be wrestling with for yeah, a while. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, and it's, well, I also think there should be ways, which there's supposed to be ways where people under a certain age can't get on these websites. Yeah. Um, and in fact, yeah, yeah, Instagram just implemented some special filtering for kids. That's right. Instagram light or, mm -hmm. or whatever they're teen. calling it. They're that. calling it a teen, teen edition okay. or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Um, I haven't even looked at what my, what my kids are seeing now, but. I'm sort of glad to yeah. hear about that. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's hard everywhere around. It's hard. You, you hate this happened. You want these parents to have some remedy. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm always thankful we live in a country where we have first amendment rights. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
you know, how, how do we balance this? I do think the Communication Decency Act or and or Section 230, there has to be some kind of reworking. Mm-hmm. You know, did it work in 1996? I, I don't know. Maybe was it regulating Internet pornography and protecting children from harmful content? Well, if that's its mission, protecting children from harmful material and content, it does seem like it would apply in this situation. Yeah. But. So this is a Third Circuit ruling, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, does that sound right to you? I am going to see if I have that written down. I could have sworn I saw that somewhere. In any event, we're, we're uh, at least now we're starting to see a court sort of putting some boundaries on the application of Section yeah. 230. And I imagine more courts will follow suit and then maybe we'll see some Supreme Court action on it at some point. Um, and we'll keep you posted. As we are yeah. keeping you posted on that story about that shipwreck, Queen Anne's Revenge. How's that for a transition? Uh, there you go. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. Well, we appreciate uh, Rick Allen for always keeping us updated on yeah. uh, what's happening in this case. And it's his case. He's huh. one of the named parties. Allen versus uh, Cooper. Yeah. That's right. So there's a recent ruling by the U.S. District Court out of the Eastern District of North Carolina in this ongoing case of Allen v. Cooper, which we thought was done, but it has had gotten new life. It's been risen from the depths. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) Well Uh, done. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. What about that transition? Uh, Frederick Rick Allen, a photographer who documented the recovery of the Queen Anne's Revenge shipwreck uh, associated with the pirate Blackbeard Mm -hmm. um, against the state of North Carolina. So the case initially arose from Allen's claim that the state used his copyrighted images without permission. He he went and found the shipwreck uh, off the coast Mm -hmm. of North Carolina and took all these images of it. The parties ultimately settled without litigating the issue, but the state kept using the photographs after this agreement. And concurrently, the North Carolina General Assembly codified, quote, Blackbeard's Law, which declared all photographs, video, records, or other documentary materials of a derelict vessel or shipwreck in the custody of North Carolina to be in the Mm -hmm. public domain. Hmm. Uh, So Allen filed suits, which include constitutional claims under the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments. And the core of the dispute revolves around North Carolina's enacting of this law, Mm -hmm. which I would say thrusts the images into the public domain. How, How in the world does the state get to do that? And Allen argued it was an unconstitutional taking of his property, violating the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. Uh, the state said, oh, sovereign immunity can't sue us, uh, which Allen believed and argued was abrogated by the 1990 Copyright Remedy Clarification Act. Oh, but the Supreme Court, in our recap, yeah. eventually agreed with the state, holding that that act did not abrogate the state's immunity. So mm-hmm. I'm still confused. Why is the state getting to own his or public domain his original photographs? Well, so. yeah. Um, just because so, they new, claim ownership. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just because we said it's mine. Uh, so under new jurisprudence that further developed uh, regarding constitutional analysis of a taking, Allen filed a motion to reconsider, which was granted. He filed a second amended complaint in February of 23, containing 10 counts alleging multiple violations, naming both the state the DNCR, the governor, other officials as defendants. And in the process of that, the North Carolina General Assembly repealed Blackbeard's law last August. Mm -hmm. So sovereign immunity, the court agreed with the state's sovereign immunity defense, indicating that under the current interpretation of federal law, the state cannot be sued for, I think this is what's key, damages Mm-hmm. related to copyright violations in federal court. And then what is the, what is this along this kind of case-by-case case abrogation? The court allows certain claims by Allen to proceed under a, quote, case-by-case case abrogation, abrogation, I can't even get that word yeah. out, where Allen's claims meet specific cr- criteria established in the recent ruling of the United States versus Georgia test. So it looks like we've got three prongs they've got to look at. And as I was kind of going through these prongs, especially related to this game of copyright infringement, yeah. I was like, 
okay, so I just told you that the there's sovereign immunity for damages for copyright infringement. There are no damages. This is what the court has said. You're not going to get any. But then under this allegement of copyright infringement under the Copyright Act, the court said Allen alleged the state published images without his consent and maliciously passed a law targeting his ongoing mm -hmm. dispute. So he only needed to demonstrate that the elements of infringement were plausibly met, and he did demonstrate mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it, um, it, we're getting into this this court's finding this approach, this three pronged test to whether or not the Copyright Act is essentially preempting that state law, right? Right, but is it only preempting it for purposes of him maybe getting an injunction? Well. Because he's not going to get any damages. Is that right? That That is my reading of it. It's, it's the okay. injunction, but also the recapture of his property rights with respect okay, to third so then, parties. Right. So then he could go and license it and get that money from them. He just is not going to get any money out of North Carolina. Yeah, I think so. Um, Alan also, a uh, second prong, Alan also <laughs> asserted that the DNCR's copyright infringements constituted a denial of due process. To invoke the due process clause, the infringement had to be intentional or at a minimum reckless and lack an adequate remedy. The court found the fact that the state enacted Blackbeard's law as a way to deal with the ongoing dispute with Allen meant that it could have foreseen, the state mm -hmm. could have foreseen a, that being deprived of procedural due process. So Allen alleged an actual constitution constitutional violation under the case from Georgia, and this claim was also allowed to proceed. Mm -hmm. The third prong, the court mentioned that a violation of the Copyright Act combined with an actual due process violation checks all of the boxes from the Georgia case. The CRCA, of course, went, quote, too far in abrogating state sovereign immunity for it to be a valid prophylactic abrogation, but it is still available otherwise. So we get a mixed bag in mm -hmm. the ruling. Uh, broad constitutional claims were struck down, but the court is allowing him to proceed on claims of direct copyright inf infringement and procedural due process. Again, North Carolina's claims of sovereign immunity are still in force, but he can, Allen can proceed under specific federal and constitutional claims related to copyright infringement and due process. And and I guess, I, Gordon, I mean, what that boils down to is he could, if he wins, mm -hmm. are the copyright... Well, a judgment the, that the, the state the, doesn't own it, certainly, okay. and a judgment theoretically that the state can't continue to publicly display and, and distribute this material. And that the works are not in the public domain. Right. That the state's actions cannot mm -hmm. place those works into the public domain. So an injunction re reclaiming, even though I don't think he ever lost his copyright in these mm -hmm. works, but, and then his ability to license. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the, Really, wouldn't it have been easier if they had just made a deal with him? <laughs> well, I think they did, and then they breached it. Well, that's true. Is, yeah. is the argument. <laughs> I meant I meant license the footage for use in their right. whatever purposes and so on. But What yeah. in the world are they doing with this footage to make this worth this fight? <clears throat> right. I, yeah. Well, and it may, <laughs> the state, I don't think the state experiences cost and expense of litigation the same way the rest of us do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that could be true. It seems like it could be considered a misuse of state funds. But hmm. it may be the bigger issue for the state is sovereign immunity and yeah. protecting that versus the other issues that are really important to Rick in relationship to the copyright. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking, All right, it's it's election season. I was going to say, it wouldn't be an election year without a few cases <laughs> along the use of music and campaign content. And our first story involves uh, the Trump campaign being ordered by a judge to stop using uh, an Isaac Hayes written song at its rallies. Um, an emergency injunction hearing in mid-September, the district court, uh, Thomas Thrash, um, ordered Donald Trump and his campaign to stop using Hold On, I'm Coming," which was written by Isaac Hayes, that's been played at over 100 Trump rallies and events. Isaac Hayes 
the third, the son of the late songwriter, was very happy with the outcome and noted that Donald Trump and his team have never asked once for permission to use the song, nor had they licensed the material. Um, the injunction doesn't require that the Trump campaign remove any existing uploaded videos that feature the song. That's kind of interesting. Uh, but the underlying copyright infringement case is going to advance into the evidentiary process and then to trial. That's where those takedown requests will be addressed. So that harm's already done. We're not going to try to unring the bell. Yeah. And so I don't remember, and I was trying to find the answer this morning mm -hmm. before we launched, when BMI and ASCAP changed, and this may have been kind of, anyway, they, they changed and granted the ability to specifically have uh, songwriters and publishers can pull specific songs from political licenses. Yeah, I noticed so there, that there too. So there are blanket political licenses, and I think I, I put <clears> links <throat> to both of ASCAP and BMI's website related to their blanket political yeah. uh, rally licenses. And again, that's only for the public performance mm -hmm. of that work during, most often during a rally or yeah. other political event. And so the Hayes family did send that notice, notified BMI, legal counsel for BMI on June 6, 2024, sent the notice to the Trump campaign. Mm -hmm. So it's dealing with public performances after June 6. And then once they've captured that work into a video, it's a synchronization right. Right. And and again, those are not having to be pulled down. So it's been really this change that in when we talked about this many, many years ago yeah. in election cycles, I don't recall there was a specific ability for I, the publisher to pull the song out. And it has it's something to do with the kind of loosening of the consent decrees I and think, fractional licensing. Yeah. That, well, when I mean, this kind of came about. You remember that. I think it's probably in the 2016 cycle, maybe, was when GMR was launching up and they were promising they wouldn't grant licenses for political right. stuff. That was one of the reasons they were able to attract certain talent. And so I think the others, in somewhere in the intervening eight years or, or 12 years, they did. Been, and I think that's when it happened. They the created the decree, political license. Yeah. Yeah. It got loosened and they were able to carve that out. So I will also say, uh, I, we're going to talk about several other mm -hmm. uh, instances happening. Uh, and, and I want to give, try and be fair to all parties, mm -hmm. <laughs> Democrat and Republican. Uh, in 2008, Sam Moore, who is yeah. the co-writer of this song, requested that Barack Obama stop using Hold mm -hmm. On. I'm coming. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So it it has kind of cut both ways. Mm -hmm. But I I know the Isaac Hayes family is happy with this, yeah. whereas the Trump campaign is not. But we've also got Electric Avenue in the in the crosshairs for Trump too. Yeah. So uh, this is Eddie Grant, the estate, I guess, of Eddie Grant, right? Um, no, Eddie himself. Uh, in the 2020 campaign. Uh, Trump was using, or the Trump campaign was using Electric Avenue in some of its material, and and uh, they sent a cease and desist letter. The, the Grant side sent a cease and desist letter. The campaign didn't respond, so this lawsuit was filed, and here we are now, four years later. Um, the judge in that case has uh, determined um, that the copyright was properly registered in 2002. It was part of a greatest hits compilation. And that was good enough. Secondly, it was not fair use. Uh, the court noted that the video wasn't transformative and, um, it wasn't used for a direct commercial purpose. The lack of transformation outweighed that non-commercial factor. Uh, and so damages are going to be determined. So this was a use in a particular video a campaign video. Yeah. Um, again, yeah. probably because in 2020, they did have uh, public performance licenses in place that were more blanket. Right. Okay. And so then we've also got Jack White and Meg White of the White Stripes have mm -hmm. sued Donald Trump for, quote, flagrant misappropriation of a recording of their song, Seven Nation Army, uh, which Trump used, again, in a campaign video, mm -hmm. not a public performance, but a video. The video posted by a Trump staffer. Um, 
Margot Martin on X at the end of August has since been removed from that platform. The video used the opening riff of Seven Nation Army in the background while Trump boarded a plane. So, you know, I don't know mm -hmm. if that was actually playing real time in the background or they just superimposed that and added it. The singers um, are seeking significant monetary damages and did not respond um so so Jack and Meg White had previously criticized the use of the sang song by Trump during his 2016 campaign. Oh. So we'll see where that one goes. Yep. And I, th I think I read a, a couple of more complaints from artists saying, hey, stop using my stuff. And my guess is the campaign is just sort of taking those and, and changing things up so they're not continuing. To yeah. And now that – now that there is this ability to notify BMI mm -hmm. and ASCAP to pull it out of the campaign license. Now, here's, I don't think I can just say, I want you to pull it out of your political campaign license uh, only for, for these candidates, Donald but not those. Yeah. Or only, yeah, it's pulled. So everybody's treated equally. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's part of the goal of the consent decrees is well, that I everybody mean, had to be treated equally. Yeah. I mean, the truth is Taylor Swift could make an, uh, could submit one of these notices to her PR. I think she's with GMR, isn't she? But, but her, whatever, she could tell her PRO, no political licenses for my songs, but then she could go and negotiate a direct license with that's right. one of the campaigns if she's so inclined. Yeah. So, it's well, very interesting from when we were talking about this in like 2008. Yeah. <laughs> it has changed. It's wild. It's come up every four years and we, well, yeah. every two yeah. years almost. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it'll be interesting. And remember there was that case involving a photograph used by a campaign that they, they oh, took. Oh yeah. I mean, there's a couple and, of yeah. those where the photographs were used. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, we'll see. I'm sure maybe one in one of those might pop up as well. We, we yeah, still got 30 days to go. <laughs> <laughs> it could right. happen. Yeah, but these these non not fair use decisions is the kind of thing that we have to be paying attention to because right. Well, third trials the charm uh, on this one. I think we talked about this case at one point early on, uh, where the music artist Ti and Tiny have now won a big verdict uh, about wow. the OMG girls dolls. Um, so. T.I. and Tamika Tiny Harris won $71 million in a jury verdict in their lawsuit claiming that toy maker MGA stole the design of the line of OMG toy dolls from their real-life teen pop group OMG Girls. The OMG, which stands for Outrageous Millennial Girls, are fashion dolls that skyrocketed in popularity since they were created in the 2019 and they fall under M mga's lol surprise line of dolls which includes lots of offshoots and over 70 characters basically so the plaintiffs in the case had filed a cease and desist well, sent a cease and desist in 2020 they followed up with uh, a lawsuit in 2021 claiming um it was cultural appropriation and outright theft of the intellectual property by stealing the look of a group mm of young multicultural women. Uh, that complaint uh, included side-by-side -side images aiming to show how each of the dolls was directly based on a particular member of the, the real group. Um, Pullins, Baja, Beauty, Rodriguez, and Brianna, Baby Doll, Womack. Okay. Um, yeah, they even the, use the same hair color. Yeah, and when I say hair color, I don't mean you know like neon green. I consider as a natural, but right, hot bright, pink, purple, neon green. Pink, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. So, so MGA said we didn't do anything wrong. The dolls were more often branded as LOL surprise, OMG, and that consumers would not confuse the toys for the short-lived band. And they said the evidence showed there was no real harm against the now defunct band, and no lost business opportunities. But, um. The lawyer for T.I. and Tiny argued that there were several instances of consumer confusion, and over three years of litigation, the case went back and forth. It was dismissed, and then it went to a trial once, uh, twice. The first trial in January of 23 ended in a mistrial after jurors heard inadmissible testimony, um, basically accusations of racism against MGA. Then the second trial ended in a verdict for MGA, where the jurors cleared the company, uh, but that was later overturned on appeal, and now we have the third try. And in this particular three-week trial, 
plus one day of deliberations, the jurors found that MGA did in fact infringe on trade dress, likeness, and so on. And they awarded the rapper and his wife $17.9 million in actual and $53.6 million in punitive damages. So I think we can expect to see those numbers adjusted. Um, but you got to wonder, yeah. you know, if it, three trials, <laughs> a mistrial I, one each way. There was more than one woman in the band so yeah. i'm not sure why the others did not join the suit well i think what's going on is that this was ti and tiny are the owners of the brand for the band and ah, probably had band it. likeness rights as part of the recording contracts okay. and things like that um and i think their daughter was one of the members of the group or something like that but mm -hmm. I, I i'm speculating on yeah that. i don't remember yeah. all, all of that anyway so that's a huge award we'll yeah. I would expect I that, that on motion that'll get modified downward. Um, the punitives seem big, although what is it? It's not quite treble the actual damages. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think there will probably be another appeal, and who knows? We may have a fourth trial to look at at right. some point. <laughs> so we'll keep you folks posted. Uh, yeah. Let's cover this next one quickly. It's. Um, a Massachusetts court responding to a federal court certified question about the application of the discovery rule in state claims. So this is a, a Massachusetts Supreme Court, Camilla Devalos versus Baywatch Inc. It's a group of professional models, Camilla Devalos leading them, suing Baywatch, which is an adult entertainment nightclub, for using their Im the model's images without consent on social media. The images were posted on Facebook between 2013, August of 2013 and November 2016 to promote the club's business, and the plaintiffs alleged that their likenesses were misappropriated, and that harmed the professional reputations. So the case starts in the Federal District Court of Massachusetts, which certifies the question to the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, um, asking regarding the statute of limitations in relation to the discovery rule. Core issue being whether the model's claims, which were filed after the normal three-year statute of limitations, could be allowed under the Massachusetts discovery rule. And uh, that rule basically tolls the statute of limitations in cases where the harm was inherently unknowable until a later date. So the Supreme Court, Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts took the case up to determine this. Are social media posts um, enough to be considered inherently unknowable? Um, which would impact when the plaintiff's claims would be said to have accrued. Um, so they said that the application of the discovery rule to social media content has to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. They recognize that the social media posts vary greatly in terms of accessibility, visibility, and discoverability. So Chief Justice uh, Scott Kafker emphasized that the vast nature of social media platforms like Facebook means that it's not always clear when a particular person would or should have mm. discovered an unauthorized post involving their image. So the court reasoned that there were a number of factors to consider. How public are the posts? How often were they shared? Whether the plaintiffs could reasonably have been expected to know about those posts? That would all need to be considered in deciding whether the statute gets told. The, uh, they didn't make a blanket rule. They're saying, hey, ad hoc decision making here have to look at the specific circumstances. And um, so the court is relying on Massachusetts case law concerning the discovery rule. And um, when could the plaintiffs reasonably have known about the harm? So and pretty interesting. That seems fair and reasonable to me. Yeah. You know, I mean, would it have been different if it was a billboard on the highway? And well, and I mean, it's sort of like asking, well, is it a remote highway somewhere in the boonies or is it downtown Boston? Right. And okay. And is it downtown Boston, but they live in North Carolina? Good point. And, yeah. and they don't ever go downtown Boston. So how would, what is reasonable for them to well, know that their image is being used in that fashion? So, and, and frankly, I mean, again, we have to consider all the factors. Is it is it okay to be sort of willfully ignorant by just choosing not to go on social or maybe not willfully ignorant, but just if you don't, if you never go on Facebook, is that a reasonable approach? Or if it was so visible, every, every user of Facebook saw it, but you're not a Facebook user. 
you know, I don't think you have to. I don't. I still don't. I, yeah. Think you've discovered it. I, I, I agree. So it's you it's, know it's, now let's say you get a text message. Hey, is this you? Well, then you have factual evidence of That's discovery. Right. Then, you, then, then you've discovered. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that, the thing with social media is that it's sort of inferring that discovery must have occurred because it was all over the place at this time and place, and you're a user, right? Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's why the question was raised, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. So, interesting. So, ad hoc determination, the court's going to have to take have a hearing and, and do some evidentiary uh, evaluation on this. Makes sense to me. It does to me, too. I agree. I like it when the court gets us the way I want them to get it. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good note to wrap up this episode of Entertainment Law Update. Everybody's happy and in agreement. How often does that happen? <laughs> yeah, rarely. <laughs> well, as always, I want to say thank you to you, our loyal listeners, for spending your time with us. And, uh, of course, to uh, ask you for your feedback. If you have anything to share, we'd love it if you would. Thanks to Mickey Glazer for bringing case to our attention. There was somebody else who brought a case to our attention this week, too, and I, I've uh, blanked on who that was, but I apologize. Okay. Anyway, we hope that you would reach out to us. Um, we have a web widget on the site at entertainmentlawupdate.com, a little red tab you can click and just record your message to us, or send us email, entertainmentlawupdate at gmail.com, and uh, our our X handle is at Ent Law Update. So, um, also want to say a big shout out to uh, Lexi, that's Alexandra Dickerson, Dickerman, excuse me, listener, and I'll say fan, who uh, reached out a week or two back and had wonderful, kind things to say about the show. She's currently looking at maybe considering going to law school, and uh, we just wish you the best of luck, Lexi. That, that's always yeah. nice to hear from fans. So, thanks. And Tamara, Thank you, as always, for doing this and being here, uh, part of the. Uh, part, well, now we're we're podcaster superheroes. <laughs> oh, we are! I love it. Can I get a cape? <laughs> I'd really like a cape. You know, our next episode is around the end of October. Maybe that's oh, a good time for us to wear capes. Maybe or something. we could wear some capes. That would be good. I, I I have a witch's hat in the closet. I maybe I don't know. Okay, I well. also want to say uh, a big thank you to. Uh, you know, we have listeners who are not lawyers, and I, I appreciate that, mm -hmm. that they stick through and listen to it. Uh, a high school friend of mine, Rob Holbert, thank you, Rob, for listening and messaging me and saying that he's been enjoying our legal podcast. So I, I love it when we have friends and family who uh, say, hey, I'm going to check this out, and this is kind of cool. So thank you so much. And yeah. uh, so I also appreciate all of our contributors who pull this together for us. And I know you're going to go through the list of who mm -hmm. all those folks are, but uh, you can find me on most social media platforms at Tamara Bennett, tbennettlaw.com and createprotect.com is where you can find me online as well. And you can find me at firemark.com or gordonfiremark.com, two different websites actually, and uh, email gfiremark at firemark.com or just gfiremark on social media. That's the way to find me. And uh, yeah, let's say thank you to the crack team of volunteer contributors who help us make this show a reality every month. Managing editor John Janicek, who is actually off on his honeymoon in england and france this week or next and next i think also charles thorne alexis allen violet jang and tasha spear and dawson holder all contributed to this episode so thanks very much to everybody for that and uh if you're interested in joining us and part of the team i hope you'll reach out to us use that email address entertainmentlawupdate at gmail.com and uh, that's going to wrap up this episode of entertainment law update. So thanks again for listening. And uh, until next time, that's showbiz. <laughs>